like we've never seen him before. I declare to you today that great and mighty is he. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Give him a praise this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who called. Jesus is alive. Jesus' grace is in abundance. He supplies you. Come on and give him praise in this place today. He's so good. Sin and darkness, whose love is mighty and so much stronger, the King of glory, the King of all our kings. Come on, declare who shakes the whole earth, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder, the King of glory, the King of all.
is on that mercy seat, our redemption seat. Because of the mercy, because of the blood of Jesus, we thank you for the blood. We thank you for the blood, for it reaches to the highest mountain, and it flows to the Church, the blood that gives me strength from day to day, it will never, it'll never lose, it will never lose, it will never.
raise up your hands and receive an abundance of his grace today. Let him just flush everything out. Let him just flush everything in this world out and let the abundance of his grace, the riches of his grace just pour in. Because Lord, what you've done, it reaches to the highest mountain. And it flows to the lowest. That's right. The blood that gives me strength from day to day. It will never lose it. Oh, that's right. Just the church declare it by faith that it reaches to the high. gives me strength from day now thank you Jesus yet will never it will never lose yet will never yet will first song that we sang, this is Amazing Grace. And that line, who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder. And I want to be continually in awe and in wonder of who he is and what he is doing in the earth and what he wants to do in and through me. Let's stir up our awe and our wonder. We're talking about the blood. There is no other way but for the blood of Jesus. And we get to stand here today free because of the blood of Jesus. What can man do to us? We are free by the blood of Jesus. And let's be in awe and in wonder of what that blood purchased and what it does and what it still does today and what it will do tomorrow because it has not lost its power. It has not lost its power. Do we know? Do we comprehend? Do we understand? Lord, open us to understand. Give us hearts to receive your truth of the blood of Jesus.
Bearing all my sin and shame In love you came And gave amazing grace Thank you for this love, Lord Thank you for the nail pierced hands Washed me in your cleansing flow Now all I know Your forgiveness and embrace Worthy is the Lamb You see
is just a little bit tainted today for some reason or another. I just want you to imagine that sacrifice that Jesus made. It wasn't just, it was for everybody, obviously, but it was just for you. And just ask him for his forgiveness and that he would draw close to you and then receive it by faith today. The Bible says that his blood cleanses us from sin. Let's just sing this to him. The blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. Oh, the blood of Jesus. It washes. There's forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. There's forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. There's forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. It washes. Just so glad today there's forgiveness. Come on, declare this forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. There's forgiveness, forgiveness in the blood. Forgiveness in the blood of Jesus. It washes. There's grace, there's grace in the blood, yes, there is of Jesus. Oh, there's grace in the blood of Jesus. And there's grace in the blood of Jesus. It washes. There's strength in 
his blood and strength in the blood Come on. of Jesus here for you today there's strength in the blood of Jesus there's strength in the blood of Jesus it washes Let's begin to declare peace over our families and over our lives, over this country. Come on. That's what we need is the peace of Jesus. Oh, it washes white as Oh, we got to sing that again. That's really good. Come on, there's peace. And there's peace in the blood of Jesus. So much peace that passes on to standing of Jesus. There's peace, there's peace in the blood of Jesus. It washes white and There is healing and there is healing in the blood of Jesus. So we receive your healing there's healing in the blood of Jesus. There's healing in the blood of Jesus. There washes white as snow. There is power in its blood. There's power in the blood of Jesus. There's so much power. church. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Amen, amen. Woo. Hallelujah, Lord. Wash us. Amen, amen. How many of you know God is good? Amen. And all the time? Amen, amen. Thank you so much for being here this morning. We so appreciate it. If you're a guest with us today, um, we just are thankful to have you. There's a little card 
um, right in the seat in front of you that says welcome. We'd love you to fill that out so we can be in touch with you this week. And um, just to tell you how much we appreciate you being here. Thank you so much for that. Wanted to uh, give you a couple things on finances. First, thank you so much for um, a couple of weeks ago allowing Pastor Jimmy and I to um, kind of just do all of those cliches rubber meets the road, brass tacks, lay it all out, all that good kind of stuff that we were able to do financially um, and just kind of share our heart and as a whole church grab a vision. I I truly believe that God is going to see us be debt free and not owe any more finances on tower. Can I hear an amen? That That was a slim amen. Let me have a big amen. 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 So, uh, Again, thank you for that. I know that was a, a, a very um, different sort of service. And if you uh, have been an ongoing part of our congregation here at Refuge City, you know that we're very cautious and very conscientious about financial discussion. And um, don't, don't necessarily make that a huge focus, but it is important in God's plan. Thank you for your giving. There's lots of ways of doing that. Continue to do that. And um, this week actually starts, um, if you were here Wednesday night, Pastor Jimmy, I just want to tell you, Wednesday night, your uh, lead into Financial Peace University was off the hook. Man, I think you talked about every subject, even money. Um, no, it was good. If you didn't get to see Wednesday night's teaching from Pastor Jimmy, it truly was uh, refreshing, off the hook, and challenging. And so this Wednesday night, we launch into Financial Peace University. Be watching um, the videos and things like that. And if you have never gone through that, please be here um, on this uh, Wednesday night to be a part of that. And you may say, hey, I'm old. My money's already set. I can't do it. There are young people that still need your wisdom, so don't not be here because of that. Amen. Amen. So we need everybody to be in the body of Christ. Um, On July the 21st, uh, we are getting excited about this, um, something that our men's ministry has been wanting to do. Um, So our men's directors, uh, Cody Brewer, and um, there's actually a committee, but Cody Brewer, Dave Neese, and a whole bunch of guys um, wanted to to start launching something. And so we are doing a day with dad um, at 6 p.m. That's a Sunday afternoon, July the 21st at Moore Park. Um, and bring your kids and we're gonna all the dads get to have fun and the mothers get to stay home and do a pedicure or something I don't know what they're gonna do but you ladies get to have a a time just um, for dads to bless our kids and spend time with our kids we've got financial or foundation stones today at 3 30 p.m. with um, here in the sanctuary so be a part of that and one of the things that we launched years ago here at Refuge City Church, I just want to discuss for a few moments, we'll be starting a brand new cycle of classes um, the very first full week in September. So after Labor Day, it'll begin after Labor Day. Um, uh, our classes on MIT, which is an acronym for Ministers in Training. We've had this going on for years. Lots, lots of you have gone through it, whether you go through it um, and at the end of it, Um, feel like you have a call to continue your progression into ministry uh, to be used in a full-time part-time ministerial way Um, you can do it for that a lot of people just do it um, so that they can um, do some collegiate courses that focus them in on the Bible and give them a better understanding this is an awesome awesome class again it's ministers in training and it will launch Uh, it's they are college level courses so there are testing in and around that and so if you've been praying about um, your future and whether or not ministry is in your future I would urge you to at least give this a look-see and um, dive into it and see if it's something for you Um, the study groups and the training groups um, as I've already mentioned uh, happen on Tuesday evenings most of them on Tuesday evenings um, throughout the 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 cycle of the school year. It's a two-year program. And on July the 28th, we'll have some sign-up areas for you. But I wanted to give you that announcement that MIT is kicking off again in September. And if you're interested in being a part of that, you've you've prayed about that or thought about that and just want to check it out, um, do that touch table here on the July the 28th and and, uh, 
We pray that God's direction and call for your life will, will be visible. I'd like, if you would, this morning to turn to 2 Kings chapter 6. Throughout um, the Word of God, there are many supernatural and miraculous events. There are, especially with these two individuals, I, I think arguably one of the two most prolific um, prophets of our Old Testament time frame are Elijah and Elisha. And the things that God utilized them to do, raise the dead and um, call rain down from heaven and 400 prophets of Baal and outrun chariots and make axe heads float. How many think that's kind of cool? Um, you know, make axe heads float and then prophesy over a barren woman and she conceived and gave birth to a son and that son died and the prophet, um, prophet Elisha came in and ministered to him and raised him back to life. And there's just so many powerful things that happen in First and Second Kings and, and especially with Elijah and Elisha. This particular story that I want to I um, render for us this morning is uh, a powerful story, one that gives me a lot of, I don't know if you guys do this when you read biblical stories or, and this started for me early on in vacation Bible school, Sunday school class, things like that. Somebody would tell a story and I would become a character in the story so I could see it better. And I don't know about you, but we used to not have these devices, so we had to use our imagination. Um, and so anybody in here um, play, I know these aren't political correct terms, but anybody in here play um, Cowboys and Indians? Just five of you. Okay, cops and robbers, you know, all of those good. Anybody in here play church? I used to play church with my neighborhood kids. Um, I'd lay hands on them and they better go down, but that was in the flesh, so... <laughs> So anyway, that's, that's another day. But anyway, you know, those, those things that we used to do in order to use our imagination. And, and this morning, in the context of these biblical stories, I think if we, if we really read them from a childlike viewpoint, as, even as an adult, um, and put ourselves in and around these amazing things, um, we, we can see a different perspective with our imagination than we have. And um, just to see it, from our heart and from, from our, our knowledge and from, from our insight. Tonight I, or this morning, I want to share with you some thoughts entitled, Open Our Eyes. Once when the king of Syria was warring against Israel, he took counsel with his servants saying, at such and such a place shall be my camp. So we've, we've got a problem at the very beginning of, of, this, of this chapter in 2 Kings 6. The king of Syria is raiding and marauding at different times. He's coming across the border um, into Judah, and he's coming across the border into Israel, and he's, he's raiding some of the communities and some of the camps and plundering and rifling and drink up me hearty yo ho whatever he's doing that's the process of this and and the problem that's happening is um for a season he was he was somewhat successful in that and all of the sudden um anytime that he selects a place to come in and to try to plunder and and rob and kill the the king of israel somehow hears about it and prepares that location and everybody evacuates or whatever. So when, when the king of Syria shows up, he's like, what, what is happening? Why, why is my plan, why, why is our, our battle plan, who, who's the traitor? Here in just a minute, we're going to see it. He basically gets all of his authority and all of his comrades together and he goes, which one of you are betraying me and telling the king of Israel that our plan? And, and we're going to read this in a minute. One of his servants says, none of us, we're, we're very loyal, but, but God listens to you in your bedchamber and Elisha's listening and he keeps warning the people before you get there. And that's the basis of this story. Let's continue on verse 9. But the man of God sent word to the king of Israel, beware that you do not pass this place. So here the king of Israel has gotten the word from Elijah. For the Syrians are going down there. So again, he's, he's warning them. There's evacuations, all that kind of stuff. Verse 10. And the king of Israel sent the place about which the man of God told him. Thus he used to warn him so that he saved himself 
there more than once or twice. So this is an ongoing thing that's against the king of Syria. And the mind of the king of Syria was greatly troubled because of this thing. And he called his servants and he said to them, will you not show me who of us is for the king of Israel? Who's Who's betraying us? Who's giving intel? Who's giving information? Verse 12. And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king, but Elisha, the prophet who is in Israel, tells the king of Israel the words that you speak in your bedroom. (laughs) I've always thought that's kind of interesting that the Holy Spirit bugged people's bedrooms. So that, that was before cameras or anyway, carrying on. Verse 13. And he said, Go and see where he is, that I may send and seize him. And it was told to him, so it was told to the king of Syria where the prophet was. And he said, behold, he is in Dothan. So he sent their horses and chariots and a great army. And they came by night and they surrounded the city. So he he sent the bulk of his army to get one man. Isn't it interesting that the enemy always has to send more forces Mm, verse 15, when the servant of the man of God rose early in the morning and went out, behold, an army with horses and chariots was all around the city, and the servant said, Alas, my master, what shall we do? Mm -hmm. And he said, this is Elijah speaking back to his servant. Elisha said, Do not be afraid, for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. If you've ever underlined anything in your Bible, I urge you to underline this verse because I think it is the cry for the church in 2024 and going for. I want to give you this as encouragement this morning. I want to give you this individually and I want to talk about it corporately. But I want to read this verse again because I, I think it is very powerful and something that you guys need to post up. If you put scriptures on post-it notes on your mirrors or your refrigerator, you need to go home and put this one up for the next few weeks and memorize it. Verse 16, he said, Do not be afraid for those who are with us are more than those who are with them. Then Elijah prayed and said, O Lord, please open his eyes that he may see. So the Lord opened the eyes of the young man and he saw and behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire, all of the angelic hosts of heaven was lined up behind and on the horizon of the troops of the world, the enemy. And and Elisha obviously could see that in the spiritual realm and the servant couldn't see it. So he prayed, let him see basically what I see. And when the Syrians came down against him, Elijah prayed to the Lord and said, please strike these people with blindness, verse 18. So he struck them with the blindness in accordance with the prayer of Elisha. And Elijah said to them, this is not the way And this is not the city. Follow me and I will bring you to the man whom you seek. And he led them to Samaria. That happened to be where the king of Israel was staying. And as soon as they entered Samaria, Elijah said, O Lord, open the eyes of these men that they may see. So the Lord opened their eyes and they saw. And behold, they were in the midst of Samaria. As soon as the king of Israel saw them, he got it. You got to get this. He gets, this is Pastor Jim using a little imagination. He gets so excited. He's like, we got it. How many of you know the first thing a lot of time God's people do is we start thinking about earthly things. As soon as the king of Israel saw them, he said to Elijah, my father, shall I strike them down? It's almost like he's fleeing. Please let me strike them down. He says it with emphasis two times. Shall I strike them down? Shall I strike them down? And the prophet answered, or Elijah answered, he answered and said, you shall not strike them down. Listen to this church. Would you strike down those whom you have taken captive with your sword and with your bow, basically prisoners of war. This is what he says to do. How many know God's ways are never our ways and that kind of, that kind of irritates a lot of human people? <laughs> Carnal people, worldly looking people, okay? So basically he says, I want you to throw a party and let them eat and drink and then go back home. Survey said, from a worldly perspective and from an earthly perspective, that does not make any sense. We finally got the enemy backed up against the wall. We finally, we've, we've got them all where we need them. We can execute every single one of them. And we can finally have peace in the land. We don't have to worry about their marauding and their, their coming over and their pillaging and, and, and stealing from us in this war. We can end it once and for all. But he said, set bread and water before them. 
that they may eat and drink and go to their master. In verse 23, I love this verse too. I want you to see the end of it because when we do things God's way, he, he settles things that are far beyond human understanding or reasoning. So he prepared for them a great feast and when they had eaten and drunk, he sent them away and they went to their master and look what happened. And the Syrians did not come again on raids into the land of Israel. So by doing it God's way, they were able, everyone, how many of you know God's ways aren't? Anybody in here ever been a little annoyed at that? Just, just be honest. I mean, we're not talking about flesh, but you're like, you know, God, I know your ways aren't our, my ways, but if you would just do it my way one time, just, just so that I could be justified or that I could feel good about it, so that I go, yeah, you got them, God. How many of you know, if, you, if you've ever read through the word of God, God never does it in the context of the earthly realm or the way we see it or think it should happen. So my imagination throughout life in this story, first time I, first time I really grasped this story, I, I, I was sitting and I, I had been challenged by my youth minister. I was about 13, 14, 15 years old. And my youth minister challenged all of us in the youth group to read our Bible in a year. And so... Um, I had tried that before, and um, I had made it to Leviticus a couple of times, <laughs> just to be really honest with you. So this time I decided I'm just going to skip Leviticus. Um, don't, I don't recommend that, but, you know, I'm 13, 14. So, so, I, so we were reading, reading through the Bible and as a youth group and a youth department, and, and I got to this story, and... And I don't know why my, my mind kind of plays kind of like in a, in, a, in a theatrical way. But I could see this servant getting up in the morning and he's got duties and he's got preparations that he has to do in order to serve Elisha, the prophet. There are certain things that he, that he wants to do. He, he, he was called to do. He was given to do. There was an expect, expectation. So he, he, he prepared Elisha's uh, Elisha's. Um, breakfast. He prepared his lunch. He prepared his meals. He, he prepared many things for him. He went before him. We know this because previous chapters, we hear about, uh, about Nathan and, and, and so many other, Nehemiah and, and how he had to dip and all this kind of stuff. And this particular servant is a, is a major focal point in all of that. And so I can see him get up on a regular morning and, and he walks out and he probably goes to get water because you have to have water in order to mix the great drink that we all love called coffee. Yes. So this was my imagination. So just bear with me this morning. So I don't know if they had coffee, don't know when it was. Somebody will Google it and send it to me today. And, and so I know I'm off or whatever. But, but the servant went out anyway to, to start preparations. And, and in my imagination, he went out to get water so that he could make, make coffee because it's a wonderful drink without spot or wrinkle. <laughs> and, uh, and as he walks out on the porch... He sees something with his natural earthly eyes that instantaneously creates worry, creates frustration, creates anxiety, and creates fear. He sees an, a giant army surrounding the whole community of Dothan, and somehow the servant knows in the spiritual realm that they have come for them. Not for the whole city. They've come for his master. And... I can see him run back in. I can see him. I can see him run back in and go, Elijah, Elijah, get up, get up, get up. You won't believe what's out there. It, it's awful. You, there's, there's thousands. I'm not talking hundreds, Elijah. I'm talking there are thousands of people. Yeah. And I, I, in my imagination as a little 13, 14 year old boy, I, I saw Elisha wake up and go, dude, man, I got another half hour. <laughs> I mean, really? I mean... I know you're concerned and you're worried about whatever you saw out there. You know, and I, I got this feeling that the, that the servant's not going to quit. You know, he's not going to quit. He's, he's, this is, I mean, this is a big deal. And so I can just see Elijah swing out of bed and say, okay, did you, did you brew the coffee yet? Is, there, did you, is the tea ready? I mean, since you got me up at this ungodly hour at least... And I, I got a feeling he comes out and the servant, and, and this is the way I saw it, and I understand, please, that he hands him his tea or his coffee and he says, no, so what's the problem? And he goes, you got to step outside. You won't believe what we saw. And I got a feeling that uh, the servant opens the door and he runs out and goes, come on, come on, come on, come on. 
And Elisha walks out and he goes, And I got a feeling the servant's looking at him going, dude, you've lost it. <laughs> you know, you can see that in the verse when he says, what are we going to do? Aren't we going to run? Aren't we going to work? What are we, where are we, we got to do something here. And you're just sitting here sipping your folders. <laughs> folders. <laughs> There's folders. In, never mind. And so, according to this scripture, he looks over, he looks over at the servant. I think, I think he smiles. We don't get the facial expression. And he just prays. He says, Father, o- open, open his eyes. And I have really felt in the last two weeks, especially after the heels of what happened yesterday, that it's time for God's people in the church to start opening their eyes. And we cannot continue to see the warfare that's about us in the worldly realm. We've got to look to the horizon that's above us. I still believe that there are fiery chariots from heaven that God's ready to call down. I still believe that God wants to revive us and renew us like he never has before. I want to give you, I want to give you this thought this morning. It's kind of a, just a practical thought from this portion of scripture. And I, I, w- I, want to look at, I want us to look at it in two different ways. I want us to look at it as a nation this morning and as a conglomerate of individuals that call Jesus Christ our Lord and Savior as the church. But I also want you to look at these thoughts that I'm going to present to you for the next few moments individually as a Christian and as a spiritual person. What do people with natural eyes see? First, first question that I that I want to answer, or that I think is imperative to, for us today, and that I think is, is being drawn out of this particular story. I, I don't believe that anything in Scripture is past tense. I believe everything from Scripture is present tense and future tense. If you understand what I'm meaning, yes, this may have been a, a 5,500-year-old story that happened between Elijah, Elisha and his servant, But how many of you know that there are many of us that still need to have some scales fall from our eyes or whatever that is, and we need to start asking God to give us heavenly eyes and not earthly eyes? What do people with natural eyes see? If you look, listen to this. If you only look through natural eyes, all you're ever going to see is the world. If all we ever do is keep embedding within ourselves the natural things of this world, the frustratable things, the issues that, that are coming against, um, coming against the Bible, coming against truth, lies that are being propitiated, propaganda that's being free-flowing. If we only look through natural eyes, all we're going to see are the things of this world. Listen to this this morning. If you only look at situations and circumstances through your earthly eyes and your earthly perspective, all the church is ever going to see and all Christians are ever going to see are conflicts and problems of the world. How many of you know we have a tendency to look for the negative? That's why the media continues to sell it to us. Hmm. In the world today, with so much confusion and hostility, with situations that happened even this last week, what are you seeing and what are you looking at? Is there hope, compassion, understanding, self-control, joy, peace, grace, and mercy? Or is there anger, bitterness, resentment, anxiety, frustration, fear, and hatred? I want to challenge all of us today, you will see what you're looking for when it comes to the spiritual demographic of things. You will see what you're looking for. Are you looking for compassion? Are you looking for understanding? Are you looking for self-control, joy, peace, grace, and mercy? Or is there this angerness and there's this bitterness and there's resentment and there's anxiety and there's worry and there's frustration and fear and hatred welling up within your spirit? A lot of people have been asking me, especially this year more than ever, and I know that it's an election year and I'm not going to try to avoid that. But I, I want to say something. I don't want to be cliche-ish. I, I, I truly feel like in my heart that God has always had the United States of America. God's always had Israel. He's always had the United States of America. 
But there is not a man on this earth that is my Savior. My Savior sits at the right hand of Jesus. And he is Lord of all. And he will put up and he will tear down. About two or three years ago, I've watched it a couple times, but about two or three years ago, and it came to my mind in this, uh, in this moment. Again, just work with me today. How many of you have ever watched or done some type of history in the past over um, Apollo 13, the mission Apollo 13? Everybody know the controversy? Anybody remember the movie Apollo 13? Starring Tom Hanks. It's a powerful movie. And they give you all the, all the issues that had to happen and, and, and they had to MacGyver the loon, the loon and they had to, you know, they used duct tape and they made a filter. And how many remember that part of the movie? I mean, it was, you talk about MacGyver showing up. I mean, it was brilliant how, how the men at NASA came up with ideas in hours that saved these three men's life. It, it, it was truly miraculous. I'll be honest with you. But all of these things have happened. They've been able to steer, if you, if you, and you can watch the movie if you want to, but they're able to steer this teeny little teardrop pod that these three guys are crammed into, and they have to steer it and, and all this stuff to get the earth in the window and all of that, and they're just about ready to enter back into the earth's atmosphere. And everybody shows back up, so they've gotten a little bit of sleep, you know, waiting for this moment. There's a few hours um, between them coming back into our atmosphere and what that means. And, and can the loon take the heat absorption? And it wasn't necessarily made for this type of heat to come back in, in this realm. And, and, and the plates on it, we don't know if it's going to be able to hold coming back in with this speed. And, and, and so... They're all sitting there, and the director of NASA, he's sitting there in, in the movie, he's adjusting his tie, and this is a factual, evidential, you can fact check it thing that was said. It was actually made the movie, and, and there, was no, um, there was no director's uh, liberties done. He quoted this exact. But the director's listening to all the little conversations going on around him. I don't think this is going to work. I, I, this is going to be NASA's worst failure that's ever going to be counted against us. And we've done everything we can. And, and I don't think, and I don't think, and I don't think, and I don't think. And the head over at NASA is talking to one of the head generals. And, and they're having this conversation right behind the director. And he stops everybody. He says, he, all of everybody sitting around the computers and looking at the screens. He says, I want everybody's attention. And he turns to this discussion with this general and the, the actual commander of NASA. And he says, with all due respect, I believe this is going to be our finest hour. And I declare to you this morning, even though they try to take President Trump out, even though they try to make wokeism something that's popular when we know it's not, even though they try to make wrong right and right wrong, black white and white black, I declare to you today, church, it's time for us to stand up. It is our finest hour. It's our finest hour. It's our finest hour. I believe it. I'm not just trying to be motivational this morning to cause you to believe it, but I want you to think about it. If we start keeping our eyes on the porches of the earth, all we're going to see is the demise of the earth. It's time to look up. The word says, for our redemption's drawing nigh. With all due respect, I believe this will be our finest hour. Can that be said now of the church and of you? I want you to think about it. Right now, where the church is at, God's doing a house cleaning and a sweeping. There are ministers that are having to pay. Be sure you're... Yeah, there they are, right there. How many know? If, if it's good enough for you, it better be good enough for me behind this pulpit. Things are happening. Things are shifting. And, and it seems to be the negative, but I want to tell you something. God is going to partner with the church for two reasons. Number one, they're going after holiness and righteousness and they're looking up. They're not looking at the things of this world. May the things of this world grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his grace. 
Can that be said of you? Is, is, this, is this the church's finest hour with the persecution? I, I think it is, and I, I want to tell you why. Do you realize that right now you can become any other religious sect that you want to in the world? You can become a Buddhist. You, you, can, you, can, you can envelop Muhammad as your, as your prophet. You can, you can, any other religious group, and, and you're, you're okay. How many of you know what gives me the factual evidence that Jesus is truly the way, the truth, and the life, and nobody comes to him except through the Father, is we're the only ones that get persecution for what this Bible says and who he is. No other religious group's under persecution. That doesn't take, I don't have to be a NASA brain scientist. I can be little old Jim to understand we probably are right Jesus is probably accurate if we're coming under this much persecution to believe in him. Is this your finest hour as the church? And listen to this. Is this your finest hour individually? So how many of you know what the church is made up of? People. The church can't have its finest hour if the people within the seats of the church aren't walking in there. You can have great inspirational speeches. You can have great talks like I'm trying to present for us today. But if our life is still screwed up, if our life is still being robbed and stolen from, and and the enemy is still resident and there's, there's There's this killing and thieving and we're allowing him to walk on us because all we see is earthly things instead of heavenly things. I want to share something with you. We've got to change the way we see it. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that's not yet been provided or seen. I don't care what it looks like. My God says he's well able. He's well able. If we allow our earthly eyes to guide and lead us, we will only see destruction and despair. I, I, this, this goes on the piggyback of that statement I made a few minutes ago that, that there's got to be some truth with Christianity because it seems like we're the only ones under persecution. And then, then I got to thinking about this. Everybody listen to this. If you get anything, I want you to get this. Remember, the enemy only attacks things that have value. How many of you know you have value? How many know your family has value? How many know your future has value? How many know your church has value? How many know your testimony has value? So how, how do you see circumstances and, and how do you see people? I think we're living, I think we're living in, a, in a time frame. We're living in a day where if we're not careful, we can, we can become very harsh, very calloused, very hardened. If I were to ask you how many of you this morning is a byproduct of something that you wished and you didn't want to be, but you, were, you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you were saved by grace from a holy God, most all of you would raise your hand. How many in here know that the word is true? It's true. We, we have all sinned and fallen. We, we've, how many of us? How many of us? The problem within the church is we forgot the word all. And so all of a sudden, after we've been saved for a while, instead of being holy, we become religious. Instead of righteous, we become legalistic. Oh, this is good stuff right now. One of the things that I believe that has to change in order for heavenly things to begin to be manifested in the church is we've got to quit persecuting ourselves. We've got to quit fighting. We've got to quit fighting. The Nazarenes, the Baptists, the Episcopalians, the Presbyterians need to come together and we all need to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to us. I don't think it's coincidental that this very week, Pastor, our leadership team, back at the first of the year, I sat down with them and I said, I really, really, really feel in my spirit, in my heart, that we need to have a 21-day fast leading up to November the 5th. 
not just because of who will be the president or who may not be the president, but I believe we need to pray for the church, we need to pray for ourselves, and we need to pray for the future of this nation. So this last week, I was um, in a prayer group with a bunch of preachers in town, and, and I brought it up in prayer. I said, this is what we're doing. Four of the preachers looked at me and said, why can't we do it with you? And they said, why don't you call the president of Climate Evangelical Association and see what he says. So I called Kevin Croker on the phone. He's our president right now. I said, Kevin Croker, this was something that came out of prayer. What do you think? He says, Pastor Jim, we're doing it. I want every church and all of the body of Christ in Klamath Falls to be in a 21-day fast. So starting October 16th, and this is what's so cool. He said, well, what were you going to do? And I told him, and he said, well, why don't we get, I said we were going to have a devotional, a 21-day devotional, where we have themes, and then we have a scripture verse that we're meditating on, and then we have a prayer. He said, why don't we break it up and let every church do two of those in the 21 days, and everybody gets a voice in the basin for our future and where we're headed. How many of you know God has multiple voices? But how do you see circumstances in people? I was challenged recently. (laughs) I was at a presbytery thing with a bunch of pastors and leaders, very, very powerful leaders. And um, there was something very judgmental that was brought forward. And any time that my spirit gets grieved, you'll, you'll know Pastor Jim real quick. Um, anytime that I get grieved or something, um, something rubs me wrong in the spiritual realm, I get very, very soft and very, very quiet, which usually annoys everybody around me that knows me. There's been issues that's happened even at KEA. Pastor Jimmy and I were in one of them um, years ago, and, and they were propitiating doing something that... I don't believe Jesus would have done. And I got very quiet, and it's kind of interesting. I put my head down, and and they continued to talk, and I just put my head down lower. And Pastor Jimmy reached over and patted my leg. It's okay, Pastor. He didn't say that. It's just, it's it's okay. And finally, one of the pastors made the mistake of going, I want to hear what Pastor Jim thinks about this, and then I've... Not, not, that, not that it's all that in a slice of toast, but if you say you're going to be Christ-like and do what Jesus does, you better be reflecting of that in everything. Amen. So there was some things being spoken of. It was the Portland area is really saturated with some division right now in a lot of ways. But how do we see things? Do we see things in the natural or do we see things in the supernatural? Pastor Jim, what do you mean by that? I'm not the same person that I was when I was out there that you see in here. How many of you know that? How many of you know you're glad you're not the same person that was out there that's in here? Are you with me? So we had some discussion about, and it was about transgenderism and sexual identity issues and and immorality and things like that. There was a discussion going on because that, and, and this was a question that was asked. I thought it was very powerful. For instance, if a prostitute and a transgender walked in here today, would you see the enemy messing with their identity and the way Christ created and destined them to be, or would you just see what they currently represent and begin to feel uncomfortable and hope that they didn't talk or sit next to you? Because see, every single one of you had an identity adjustment. Give me an amen. Amen. How many of you are not the people you used to be when you were in the world? How many of you want people to remember you or see you like that? I don't. 
How many of you know people, the lost and the hurting and the prodigal, some of your sons and daughters and grandsons and granddaughters are going to walk in here and they're going to want to come back and get close to the Lord and they may not represent the Jesus that they supposedly are going to request into their heart right now, but you don't look at them then, you look at them where they're going. We can't look at them who they are, you got to look at them who they will be in Christ. If we don't ask God to start allowing us to see things like he does, then we won't see the revival and the awakening that's starting in the church and the people of God. Listen to this. I believe that all of us are aware of Jesus' end time prophecies, but there's still one that we haven't seen yet and that we're waiting for. Not too long ago, I was again in a circle and, and people were, this statement was made and I had just read this and, and I got excited. I got excited. I went, this is the prophecy that hasn't happened yet. There is one prophecy leading to the end times that hasn't happened yet, and it was a prophecy from Jesus, so I believe it has to happen before him to come back. Now, Pastor Jim, are you saying he's not going to come back right now? Bear with me. But there is a prophecy, and when I give you that prophecy, you're all going to go, ooh. So I was reading my Bible. Someone walked up to me and, and said, Pastor Jim, all of the prophecy has been fulfilled in order for Jesus to come back. The temple can be built right now. This can happen right now. We could have Magog and, and Gog come in and, and Russia and, the, and all that. All the prophecies are in alignment right now. And I said, yes, but there's one I haven't seen yet. Yeah. And they were like, okay, what's the one you haven't seen yet? And I said, it's the one that Jesus said, even greater things will you do than you've seen me do. I don't know about you, but up to this point, I've seen a lot that Jesus did. I'm waiting to see some stuff that Jesus didn't do. How many of you believe that was a prophecy? You need to look at the context it was written. He said, one of the very last things he said to all of his disciples is, even greater things you will do than you've seen me do. I don't know about you, but I'm, I am expecting that the end time revival will be full of some stuff that's even greater than what Jesus did. That God's people are going to be used even in a greater magnitude than what he did. I don't know about you, but I'm ready for Joel chapter 2. I'll pour my spirit out upon all flesh. How many is ready for God's spirit to move? There's a revival and a spiritual hunger starting in the people of God. There's a fresh passion beginning to arise. We're having visitors. We were talking about it this week at the, at the, at the pastor's prayer meeting. Visitors are coming. People are coming back. I want to tell you something. It's not about numbers. It's about making a place for people to get reunited, reacquainted, and begin to know in whom they have believed and am persuaded that he is able to complete in them that which he started. I believe the particles are going to come back by the droves. I believe that people that have been persuaded and people that have fallen in to the, to the earthly eye and the things of this world are going to get disgusted in that and they're going to stand up and they're going to say, as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord. There's a revival and a spiritual hunger. Are you ready to be a part of it? Are you ready to be a part of it? What happens if we start having church every night? Three people said yes and a couple people said I'm already tired. I mean, no, it seems that God's provision and protection always manifests. Listen to this. God's provision and protection always shows up and manifests during the church's greatest persecution and despair. Have you ever seen that in history? The minute that the church comes under persecution, that's about the minute that we get on our knees, which we should have stayed on them to begin with. And God's glory and power and authority shows up. Hmm. I believe if we want revival, we have to look beyond our earthly eyes and ask Jesus to give us heavenly ones. Many have decided, listen to this, I, wanna, I don't want to put a negative on this, but this is something that we need to correct and we need to correct it this morning. Many have decided it's easier to quit, give up, be offended. I believe that there are people that have powerful giftings of the Holy Spirit that are in this place. And the reason why God can't release the gift that's within you is because you've embraced an offended spirit. I'm going to let that settle for a minute. You're more consumed about your justification than you are about the sanctification of your Savior. You're more consumed about being right and looking right and, be, and seeming right than you are about him being right and him who sits on the throne be all glory and honor and power forever and ever and ever. 
I want to share something with you. If the church is going to be the supernatural force that creates a revival that causes even greater things than, than Jesus has done to be done, and Joel chapter 2 is spirit to be poured out on all flesh, we're going to have to quit getting offended over every little teeny tiny thing. I want to say it again. We're going to have to quit getting offended over every little teeny tiny thing. Matter of fact, I want everybody to repeat after me. I, I choose today, today not to be, not to be offended, offended at you. At you. Thank you. I, I do the same to you. <laughs> How many has realized the biggest dividing force within the church is offense? We get hurt and we get mad. And then 20 years later, we can't remember what we're hurt and mad about, but you came to our potluck and you didn't like my casserole dish, so I'm going to get my, I'm going to get my 9 by 16 Pyrex plan and I'm going to go home with a huff. <laughs> See, we laugh about it. We laugh about it. We get a little snicker on because the way Pastor Jim presents it, it seems so childish. Well, I want to share something with you. The church has to quit being offended. If the prostitute and the transgender comes in, we have to quit being offended and see them in the identity that Jesus made them, not what they're trying to embrace. Many have decided it's easier to quit, give up, be offended, and wallow in self-pity as a victim than stand up and put on the armor of God. I want to share something with you. It's time for the church to quit being a whole bunch of victims coming together to try to somewhat console each other. I'm tired of Bible studies where everybody get together and we tell our war stories of how hard it is to be a Christian. Oh, give me a break. <laughs> what happened to great and mighty is he. Great and mighty is the Lord our God. Great and mighty is he. I don't want to talk about who I was. I want to talk about who Jesus is making me to be. That's the point of a Bible study. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Listen to this. The problem with the church today is we're running in retreat instead of letting the issues and things of this earth cause us to unite and stand together in greater unity and boldness with a fresh power as a holy army ready to march on behalf of the gospel of Jesus Christ and our Savior Jesus Christ. I have a question for you, and then I'm going to do point two, and then we're done. Are you calling and praying down heaven, or are you just preparing and positioning your emotions for a disappointment in the negative? The Lord hit me with this question a couple of weeks ago, and it really challenged my spirit. Am I calling and praying down heaven, or am I just preparing and positioning my emotions for another disappointment and another series of negatives in my life? Are we partnering too closely with all we are watching around us on our earthly surroundings and only believing and trusting in earthly things and not in heavenly things? Number one, what do people with natural eyes see? And number two, what do the people with spiritual eyes see? There's a couple things that I... I grasp from this portion of scripture that really motivated me this morning that I want to conclude with my thoughts for you. Here, here's, this, here's this first one. Spiritual eyes see the power of God on the horizon. I want to share something with you. If the church walks around like God's defeated, then we're going to stay in a defeated state. I don't know about you, but I see everything that's going on. I see the armies of the world. I see the, I see the ideologies. I see all the confusion. It's not that I'm blinded to it, but I want to share something with you. I believe that there are fiery chariots from heaven that are waiting for people to call down the principalities and the powers of heaven. How many know we talk about principalities and powers in the earthly realm? I think it's time that the heavenly principalities and powers get unloosed in the earthly realm. His kingdom come. His will be done on earth as it is in heaven give me an amen. amen spiritual eyes see the power of God on the horizon the Lord wants you to see through his eyes to see his gifts and his power do you know the reason why the, that that the enemies tried to make God's people offended and keep them offended with one another so that they'll stop being gifted to do what Jesus has called them to do that's it if I get offended if I get offended at pastor Mark I spend all of my brain time trying to figure out how to get even with Pastor Mark. I know vengeance is mine, saith the Lord, but I haven't got there yet. Okay, this is Pastor Mark and I's problem. 
and I'm going to bring it up at four Bible studies and 16 prayer meetings. I'm just, I know I'm being a little practical, but we got, we got to move past it. We got to get past all this stuff, all this junk. We wonder why, we wonder why the spiritual realm in the world right now is disintegrating. It's because we have allowed ourselves to stop being spiritual. Myself included, I'm preaching to myself. I don't know how many times I've gotten up. I don't know how many times yesterday I got up and yelled at the black box. And then my powerful little wife walked in. I love powerful little wives. <laughs> and it's amazing to me. This is how the earth will affect you. This is amazing. I, I, was, I was fit to be tied. I'm having my own little carry-on thing in the front room. She walks in and she mutes it. Nothing I get frustrated more is when the <laughs> wife takes over the remote when I have it on my chair. She moots it and she looks at me and she goes, let's stand and pray. You know what the first thought was? All of you guys are so spiritual. Yeah, let's pray. <laughs> I went, no, I want to punch some po- folks right now. <laughs> you know what the problem with the church is? We have to get in the mood to pray. Because the mood of this world has so tainted us, we know that we're not in the right position to be able to go to the throne. We know if we brought our crown or our gift to the altar, he'd be going, really? Really? After the way you've acted? Nobody needs to tell me that. So I'm like, so I looked at her. This is, I'm spiritual. I looked at her. Give me five minutes. <laughs> Just give me a little time, babe. So I, she walked out of the room. I turned it back on. And she came back in. She goes, let me help you with your five minutes. And she turned my TV off. All of you that clapped in your 21 days of fasting, I expect your TV to be in the garage. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. You know the problem, though? I'm I'm trying to be very, I know this is some, I hope this is ministering to you today. But in about five minutes, she walked back in and I stood up. I, I, want, I want to confess something with you. I shouldn't have to, to pray about my attitude to change my spirit to connect with my Savior. If I was looking at things from the spiritual realm and not just the earthly realm, I would have already been in the spirit and not in the flesh. Somewhere Paul says that over and over again. Don't walk in the flesh, but walk in the... And we're not doing it. It's time to drop those earthly eyes and keep us from receiving the promises of God and turn around and face that old devil and fight him with the power of prayer, faith, and fresh, fresh awakening. This morning, I truly believe the heavenly hosts are on the horizon if we could just start calling them down and asking for their intervention. I commission everybody, everyone look at me, those of you at home, I want you to do this this week. I want you every single morning when you wake up and every single evening before you go to bed, I want you to release the kingdom of heaven upon your life, upon your family, upon your home, upon your health, upon your mind, upon your finances, and upon this world. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Do you, can you remember that? If not, play this back. But I want you in the morning and the evening, we need to start releasing heaven over the top of us. How many in here this morning? Now, I want a show of hands. So if you get aggravated and say, I don't like to raise my hand, then you've got a rebellious spirit, and I'll pray for you after service. <laughs> I'm telling you, we've gotten, we've gotten an attitude in church, and we wonder why Holy Spirit's not present. How many in here this morning want God to change how you see things so you can start seeing heavenly armies, heavenly authority, kingdom things, and the releasing of the miraculous? How many of you want to see those things? Pastor Jimmy, come. So I I added this thought after my wife and I prayed. And we prayed for more than five minutes. I want to share something with you. Listen to this. Listen to this. Everybody hear this. This isn't a condemnation. This is a challenge. We got to quit trying to go to prayer meetings to pray and start making prayer meetings happen where we are. Pastor Jim, are you against prayer meetings? Don't email me. No, I'm not. 
But what I'm saying is if we have to get in the car to come to prayer to pray, we should have already been praying and that should just be a bonus point. Amen. Give me an amen. amen. We need to bring it back into our, our, our lives and our spirits again. Here's this last thought this morning I want to pray. Man, you're getting out early. You better love me going out the door. <laughs> My wife and I finished yesterday praising and praying. Turn the TV off. <laughs> I went in to try to get my back to pop. And, uh, and I begin to intercede and I begin to pray for this morning. And the Lord said, I want you to conclude with Revelation chapter 22 tomorrow. I want all of my people to hear it because they're living their lives currently under such attack that they feel like they're losers, but I already made them winners. How many know if you see through spiritual eyes, you realize God's people already win? How many in here love, love, like, like to listen to Paul Harvey? The rest of the... And you were trying to guess who he was talking about or what in, incident he was talking about or whatever. I, I just want to give you God's Harvey's Revelations 22. He already told us we win. That should have been the biggest amen of the day. We win. His people win. He wins. The devil loses. The devil's thrown in the lake of fire. The devil's gone forever. We win. He has a mansion waiting for us. Hmm. How many know we're not defeated today? We're winners. Turn to the person next to you and say, you're an overcomer in Christ Jesus. Tell him, you're an overcomer in Christ Jesus. Tell him, tap him on the shoulder and say, you're an overcomer in Christ Jesus. You're an overcomer in Christ Jesus. So I was popping my back in my inverter doodad. And I'm going to read the verses and then we're just, I'm going to have some connections for us and then we're going to leave today. But I, I really, some of you need to re-listen to this, this week. You need to podcast it. You need to re-listen to it. So if you know what an inversion thing table is, it flips you upside down and you hang by your ankles. All the blood rushes to your head. I think it's a good thing sometimes because I, I think that re-energizes molecules. I don't know what happens up there. <clears throat> but as I was hanging there upside down and I only do it for a minute or two, Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, have you already conceded Listen to this. Have you already conceded to prepare yourself for disappointment instead of walking in the power of being an overcomer for what I paid for on the cross? We've been made more than conquerors. And I want to share something with the church today, the big C, this church and anybody else that listens to this. We've got to quit acting like we've already lost and start walking in being an overcomer in Christ Jesus and a conqueror for Christ. The things of this world will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and his. You know what that tells me? It's time for us to start going after more glory and more grace. Revelations 22, 12 through 14 says this, Jesus speaking, Behold, I am coming soon. Give me the biggest amen of the day. Behold, I am coming soon, bringing my recompense. How many know Jesus is coming with a day, there's a day of reckoning coming. Bringing my recompense with me to repay each for one for what he's done. And then he declares it again, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life and that they may enter the city by the gates. How many are ready to enter the city by the gates? I don't know about you, but all this stuff that's going on, everything that happened this week and yesterday, if the trumpet sounds this morning, I just, I just at two o'clock, if the trumpet sounds, how many of you know, it don't matter anyway. Now, I know we're supposed to be in it, but the problem was we're more 
of it then. Everyone hear my instruction. We're to be in it. In, we're to be in the world, but we're not to be. Everybody, everybody look at the person next to you and go, go, I'm getting a little of it off me. I'm getting a little of it off me. We need to make a, we need to make a t-shirt that says, get the of it off you. Get the of it off me. Stand with me this morning. I love you, brother. Whew. Hallelujah, hallelujah. I'm going to open these altars up here in just a few moments for some of you, as many of you as want to, to come to pray. I, I want to ask you this today, not just, not just as a pastoral commission, but as, but as a Christian connection. Don't, don't go home. Don't go home and try to figure out who the dude was that shot at President Trump and spend 27 hours watching. Don't. Today, I want, you to, I want you to sit in the... Some of you need to get back to the swing that you built on the porch that you said you were going to hold hands, and that's why you got it. That's right. Woo! Pastor. Some of you need to get the lawn chairs around the fire pit that you built in the back of the house so you were going to do s'mores with the kids, and you never did. I'm speaking some truth. Some of you need to take a, some of you need to take a walk around your block and pray for your neighbors and call them out and ask for God to bring them in. This is a good word today. This is the Sabbath, and today we're going to keep it holy. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. We're going to keep it holy today. If you don't have a fire pit and you don't have a swing, Walmart's open. Don't, don't turn the TV on. Don't look at your device. Don't spend three hours scrolling through whatever. Just put that aside today. And use today, Lord, I, I need a recalibration in my spirit. I, I need to stop allowing my vessel to have poured into it earthly things. And today I want to connect with you and I want some spiritual things. I'm going to turn my worship on. I'm going to get my song back. Can I hear an amen? I'm going to get my praise back. I'm going to get my faith back. I'm going to get my believing back. I'm going to get my hope back. I want to share something with you. It's not hopeless. It's, it's not hopeless. It's the most hope-filled time we could ever live. Two things that I want to ask you today before I open up these altars and I'm going to invite you to come. Here's the first one. If you're here today, no, no, bow your head and close your eyes. I want you to look. If you're here today and you know that you need to recalibrate Jesus in your life and he's not the center of your life and you don't want to leave here until that happens, I want you to raise your hand right now. Raise it up high. Come on. Don't be ashamed of it. Raise it up high. I want Jesus to be, I want Jesus to be number one, number one, number one, number one, number one. Wow. Now here's the second thing. And I'll, probably obviously all of you know what it is because I'm going to raise my hand with this one too. I'm going to put it down. I'm going to raise it right back up. How many of you today need to surrender to the Lord that you need to stop looking at earthly things more definitively than you are and start expecting kingdom things and heavenly things? That the things of this earth needs to start growing strangely dim. I got to quit it. I got to stop partnering with it. I got to stop. I got to stop. I got to stop me from doing it. I got, I got, I've got to stop it. I want to pray over both of you today both of those individuals, groups. Father, I thank you and I praise you this morning for those that raised their hand that needed to recenter themselves with you today. Lord, I pray right now, I pray right now that they'll begin to cry out and speak out. Jesus, come into my life. Jesus, transform me. Jesus, renew me. Jesus, embrace me. Jesus, forgive me. And Lord, Lord Jesus, set me on the path like you've never done before. Father, I pray for them today, Lord, that the things that would distract them, the things that they've partnered with that would try to steal, kill, and destroy with them, Father, I pray today is the day that they become a conqueror and an overcomer in Christ Jesus. At the name of Jesus, I pray every principality and power that thinks it has permission to torment their mind, their body, their spirit, and their emotions be gone right now in Jesus' name. Father, for that second individual group that we raised our hands. Father, I pray right now, Lord, for a holy intervention. And I pray for a deliverance in our minds and spirits that would cause us to get consumed of the things of the world and forget the kingdom in heavenly realms. 
Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name today. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever and ever. And the church said, amen, amen. amen. If you'd like to come, come. Thank you so much for joining us again on our live stream services. We're so grateful that you're a part of our church family. We want to encourage you to stay connected with us through Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Also, for more information on who we are or how you can get plugged in at any of our campuses, visit our website at refugecity.church. We so appreciate the continued support that you provide through your tithes, offerings, and missions pledges. We, we cannot, cannot wait, wait to, to see, see you next time. time.